All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of The Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. Sorry, guys, I just drank a lot of soda. Last episode, we are doing the part three of the trial as we kind of figured out that we found our third party for a trial who, uh, who's in the crime scene. And now, we're hopefully, hope he comes and like, Gets helps it see what his side of the story is, I guess. Seventeen of April, twelve forty one PM The Old Bailey Defendant's Antichamber. Ah, uh, Gina, how are you holding up? I'm starting to feel quite warmly towards her frequent sh cold shoulders now. Oh, uh, Ginny, are you all right? Why aren't you saying anything? Because the third party. What's the point, eh? Why go all this trouble and fight so hard for the likes of old me? What? Well, you saw it, that picture. That what, what picture? Ah, uh, you mean this? The photograph taken by Hurley's red hood handed a quarter? Why, I didn't think you'd be the catcher the scene like that. This, that's for sure. It's hopeless. Anyone who sees that is gonna think oh, I did it, ain't it? Well, I won't pretend it wasn't a bit of shock when the prosecution first pre presented it to the court. Surely you got in your doubts by you, about me now? You can't think, still think I'm innocent? Of course I can. Hmm. Jenny, why don't you talk to us? Tell us what really happened that night. Eh? Uno's cleverly managed to piece together new information, but still. We really like it if you hear it from you. Alright then. It was after we had dinner that together at your place, right, Iris? Then we all had a chat about it in your office, didn't we? Yes, I remember. After that, I just couldn't get to sleep, so I slipped out and went down to the street to to the two to one. And when the next place that I had to know if I if Iris' story was there or not, the hound of the Baskervilles. I don't know what's it all about or nothing, but if you ask me, there's something about it that show homes don't like. It's something we don't want people reading. So that's why you lied to Iris about sticking in love with Windabank for safekeeping. At least that's what I thought at the time. So you broke into Windabanks? I just had to know if it was there or not. I mean, I had no idea all this was going to kick off, did I? I stuck the lock and snuck inside as dark as you like in there. So I gave the oil lap on the counter a bit of wick and that's when... What do you think you're doing? Ah! I nearly died. I did. The next thing I knew. I grabbed the gun off the counter and waving it in the air like I don't know what. Oh, you're the girl who was in here this afternoon. I didn't like think pickpockets went in for armed robbery. The mental script. Have you got it here? It shows me little papers with you, a story. I beg your pardon. The hound of the something or other. If it's here, I want to see it. I'm sorry, young lady, but I sooner died than relinquish an article belonging to one of my customers. I don't want it. I just want what would I do with it anyway? I just want to see it's there. That's all. Oh, you want to see it, do you? I want to know if Sholmes really pawned it here or not. Please let me see it out and I'll go. Oh, very well then. But for pity's sake, stop waving my gun around, would you? So then the old cover locked the storeroom, and we both went inside. And that's when you looked at it, and it was there, all right. The mantle script. Soames wasn't weren't lying after all. He did all that just to check for me, Ginny. 
Anyway, then there was a bit of kick up out in the main bit of the shot. The Skulkin brothers arriving on the scene, yes. What was that noise? Someone breaking in? Dear me, is there some burgers convention here tonight I don't know about? I think I forgot to shut the door behind me, sorry. I better go take care of it. Can I possibly have my gun back? Yeah, that's what I figured. You hand him back the gun. Oh well, I'll come with you in. Now don't be foolish, young girl. You must stay right here. Don't leave this room under any circumstances. And with that, I took out the gun. And I mean, walked out, back out into the shop. I lumbed back into the storm, like he said, and sending me ears in the dark to what was going on. It sounded like they got into a bit of a scrap. I started to think I should help, see? So I was just about to go out to the store room myself, and then when... Bang. Wait, two? Two gunshots? Or a couple of shots cold off. Two, I think. Almost at the same time. And then there he was, right at me feet. Lying face down on the floor. I was right next to the storeroom door, so I slammed it shut and locked it quick as you like. Because you thought whoever had shot Mr. Winmake might come for you. Yeah, so I went to grab the old Kolb's gun. I figured I'd put up a fight at least. And when I got a better look at him, I knew... When the bank was a Ghana. Felt funny in me head all of a sudden and kind of dizzy. And after that, I don't remember nothing. That must be when you passed out, Gina. Yeah, you still hold the gun still. If I don't, I hadn't done what I done, the old Kolb might still be alive. Did you tell the police everything you just told her? Of course I did, but they didn't believe a word of it, did they? Or at least it was if I kept telling lies and make things even worse for me. It'll be alright, Ginny. Don't worry. Just stay strong a little longer. You know it's about to put the real culprit up through the mail. That cold what is there in the afternoon? That egg but Benedict? Egbert Benedict. I still don't remember how he looked at me like I was nothing. He, he was there that night. For sure. We don't know his real name yet, but I'm convinced that he's involved somehow. Anyway, thank you for telling us what happened, Gina. I appreciate your honesty. You what? You can leave it all to Runa's capable hands now, Ginny. Looks like we... Mr. Nava Odo. Yes. How come you still trust me? I don't get it. Because I have to defend my clients. I mean, have you forgotten what I happened here before? Come on, it was only two months ago. Me and Mr. McGilded, we told you a pack of lies. And you got the whole bo got the boxer off with him, even though he was a killer. No, I could never forget that. Oh, I did what I thought was best at the time, but the pain of that air of judgment doesn't get any easier to bear. Still, don't forget I also made you a promise. Told you I'd be on your side to the bitter end, no matter what. But what if I'm lying? You could be working to get off another killer in the hook, for all you know. I was once in your position, Gina. I was the accused in a trial. You were? Yes, trial one. Before I left Japan, I was accused of murder. And strange as it might sound, the circumstances of the crime were pretty damning. I was sure that no one would believe it. It wasn't me who'd done it. Oh, no, no. But there was one person who stood up for me. Who believed in me. And was prepared to defend me. My best friend. Kazuma! You know, Ske, no one believes in more than I do. Leave this to me. All you need to do is put your faith in me, and I'll do the rest. I was so happy, I cried. But even then, somewhere inside me, I couldn't help thinking, Surely, he doesn't really believe in me, not completely. But, 
I was wrong. As soon as my trial began, it was pretty obvious that he had an absolute unwavering belief in me. And in turn, I developed an absolute unwavering belief in him. Since then, I came to realize, if you want someone to believe in you, you have to believe in the other person first. What are you saying? I promise you, Gina, that no matter what happens, I'll keep believing in you. So you don't need to worry. I won't let you down. Even though I'm a diver and no good liar, you're not like McGilded. I know that. Eh? That's right, you're our friend, Ginny. Iris, we know you better than you think. And we've come to the conclusion that you're someone we can trust. Yes. That's really all we need to know. Exactly. Um, Mr. Naru Odo, I am... I... <laughs> okay, you're crying. Defendant Jean Illustrated, a legal representative. Court proceeds are about to resume. Head to the courtroom immediately. Yes, of course. Thank you. See here? I've been in a both defendant and the defending lawyer in my time, so I only know too well just how hard it was to put on your faith in another. And I also knew just how hard it was to bear the burden of another, pulling all their faith in you. This is it at last, the final chapter, the final battle. Wish me luck, Sato-san. I hope you're watching over me too, partner. Kazuma-san! Alright, let's do this. Hold up, guys. Okay. So I just really noticed it just now. I wasn't recording desktop audio. Yeah, I didn't know I didn't record desktop audio. Well, it kind of sucks to be honest. Like, you guys heard only my commentary, but not the game itself and the music too. So that really sucks for like 12 minutes into the video and like the past video. So yeah, that's my bad guys. I really apologize. I am very inconsistent with my recordings. And it's sad that this happened again, which makes me very upset. So, let's continue. But yeah, but we discovered- yeah. <laughs> I hereby call this court to order as we resume the trial of Miss Gina Lestrade. Lord Von Zeeks, have you successfully put sub in the witness? The sub poena was delivered to communication station where the man works immediately, my lord. However, the heavy rain has delayed the arrival of his carriage, it would seem. Hmm, I see. Then let us turn to our attention to the expected description. Press up the case heard by the court this morning. The glaring omission by the third bullet in your report is a serious blunder, Inspector. Uh, yes, sir. I can only apologize, my lord. Scotland Yard is so useless. Let's be real here. They didn't even notice a bullet inside Trolms' pouch. Uh, although the defense's chemical analysis of the blood at the scene makes for a compelling argument, I cannot permit such untried methods as using with evidence in my court. Hm, it's a big mistake to class Hurley and me. A very big mistake. My lord! The sub point witness has just arrived at the building already? Thank you, officer. Show him to the set without delay. Mr. Egbert Benedict. I didn't expect to be crossing paths with him again so soon, and certainly not like this. Why are these two still on the stand? They should be kicked out of the stand. Thank you for complying with the court so point at such short notice, sir. But of course, my lord. 
As an upstanding member of London society, it is my pleasure to oblige. N now, kindly state your name and occupation for the record. Ashley Graydon, Communications Officer. Ashley? Mr. Graydon and I work at both London's Central Communications Station. Now, perhaps would someone kindly explain what all this is about? You were apprised of the situation by the court officer. On your way here, I presume. Yes, I was. Something to do with a murder that took place at the pawnbrokers on Baker Street. And some nonsense about me having been there on the night in question. That is the accusation indeed. This really is beyond a joke, you know. Very well, without further delay, the court will hear your testimony now, Mr. Graydon. You will respond to the accusation made against you under oath. He's gonna dance. <laughs> gladly, my lord, gladly. Witness testimony. An accusation. Naturally, I have occasion of the make use of pro unbroken services from time to time. But are you seriously suggesting I colluded with these thugs to break into the place on the night of the murder? I have no intention of admitting to such an outrageous accusation. Even if certain parties here present claim that my blood was found at the scene. Some Scaramouche detective's homebrew tincture can hardly be taken as serious evidence. Okay. So you deny the accusation completely, do you? I must say, I am dismayed. For the highest court in the land to be swayed by this self-professed detective's toy. It was the will of the jury and our great British system. Justice system demands that the jury's will is upheld. Then it would seem we have the misfortune of a most inept assembly of jurors today. B by golly! How am I expected to be detained here? If following the defense cross-examination, your involvement in this matter has not been established. You'll be free to leave immediately. Good, then I shall be away in time for afternoon tea. Some small consolation at least. Let us not hold up Mr. Graydon any longer, Cassisir Council. Proceed with the cross-examination, so we meet again, Mr. Egbert Benedict. Or is it Mr. Graydon? My apologies, you are. Ryunosuke Naruhoto, defense lawyer. We have met. If you say so, Ashley Graydon, Enchante. So... What? what? Why are you drawing my- your hat? I trust we can conclude this quickly. Ugh. I'm not holding your flashy hat while we do. Alright, press him for every single statement we can do. Yes, we even met in the very pawnbrokery where the crime took place on the afternoon of the day in question. Though, of course, you introduced yourself in a different name at the time. It was Mr. Edgar Benedict, I believe. Tell me what have you... The witness is here to testify about events that took place that night. He is under no obligation to answer such unrelated questions. He can't be serious. Thank you. I certainly... Do not feel inclined to answer such an inappropriate question. So he's going to be evasive, is he, in an effort to not give anything away? This could be tricky. Uh, oh, dang it. I gotta be aware. Pretty sure he concluded. Have you seen these two men before? This pair? No, I don't associate with criminals. Said by a man who introduced himself as Egbert Benedict. I'd like to know I have to think why well, I have to think for this. Who made this outlandish accusation against me? 
the young lawyer there in the black. This is a farce. Whose idea was it to permit an outsider to work in a British court? Oh my god. Well, needless to say. Where were you around at one in the morning and the night in question, sir? That is the past the hour I wish would normally retire. Certainly. How is not in the company of these rapscallions? Are you able to prove that? Listen carefully, my learned Nipponese friend. For you to appear under a gross misapprehension at this point. What do you mean? No witness maintains he was not at the scene of the crime. He has no obligation to prove his absence. If your accusation is that the witness was present at the scene, then the obligation lies with you to prove your assertion. You will fulfill that obligation but before putting any more unreasonable questions to the witness. A silent victory wiggle, thanks. Even if certain parties are present, claim my blood is found yet. Blood was found at the scene of the crime, there's no question of that. Mr. Sholm's chemical analysis has probably identified the su substance as such. I am not the only human to have blood running through my veins, am I? How can you be sure that the blood is mine? It could equally be the blood of one of these two miscreants. And every individual's blood has slightly different composition, it seems. Mr. Sholm's chemical is able to differentiate the Spare me the science lesson. Who is this Sholm's character, anyway? Oh, I, I assume all Londoners will know the name. He's a great, well, a renowned detective. So even you are unable to bring yourself to say the great detective. A great detective, you say? It's now in the realm of fairy tales, are, are we? Huh? What do you mean? Do you have something to say about that, Mr. Skulkin? Err, uh, what? I'm trying to... Eh? Fuck! What voice did I give him? Oh, God. Err, uh, what? Me? Okay. No, Mr. Skulkin next to you. Right, I had to have to hear with this. How many times I gotta tell you? Not you, you damned idiot. Yes, I know. You're not a big bruv sulky. Mr. Nash Skokin. Eh, hey, Corb Lightning. You what? Is it not the case that when Mr. Graydon just spoke, a thought went through your mind? Would you care to share that thought with the court? Eh, hey, me thoughts I don't have none of them. It must have been him. You what? Mr. Nash Skokin, answer the question, please. What went through your mind when Mr. Graydon just spoke? Nothing. Honestly, not good. Nothing, I was just thinking. If we leaves his arm around his leg that much more, he'll open the wound again, that's all. What wound? Where he took the bullet, of course. It was only two days ago. He ain't gonna be healed up yet. So it was, um, well, you know, I was worrying for him, and... I, uh... Oh, hell's bells! Oh, ho, ho, ho. So he, those brothers, knew the bullet wound. Mr. Graydon, did you hear that? What? Your comrade is- I mean, your comrade is worried about you, it seems. And on account of your injured arm... My lord. Oh, yes, Mr. Graydon. I have no idea what these two wretches are talking about. Certainly, I shouldn't be expected to answer anything in relation to their mindless annuations. Sinuation? Hmm. We know that someone other than the victim was hit by the bullet at the scene of the crime two nights ago. And from the height of the bullet in the wall, a person was likely hit in the upper arm or thereabouts. Perhaps you allow a court official to examine your arm, sir? The left arm you're currently clasping with your right hand as if in pain? No, I refuse. You have shown no evidence whatsoever that links me to these common thieves. 
Accordingly, I am not obliged to permit such invasion of my privacy. Yeah, you're not being cooperative, are As I've already said, I'm completely uninvolved in all this. I never had anything to do with the pawn brokery, where this fellow was killed whatsoever. I take offense to the simulation that I was in any way involved. Hmm, you claim you had nothing to do whatsoever to do with Mr. Banks pawn brokery? My lord, the defense would like the last statement to be added to Mr. Graven's formal testimony. Very well, counsel. Continue with your testimony, Mr. Graydon. The bottom line is, I never had anything to do with the palm broken ceremony where the man was killed. Some scar in which the detected homebrew tincture can be taken as serious evidence. Don't forget, sir, that Mr. Herlock Shum is the most famous detective in the world. And the most famous detective in the world tells the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, hmm? Um, well, um, oh no, I can't think of how to answer that. I once saw the world's most famous swindler thrown into jail. He allegedly told the truth, the whole truth, and nothing, and what turned out to be a pack of lies. Uh, quiet now. As you are no doubt aware, the central communication station is the heart of the country's information network. My work is there of a paramount importance, and you have kept me from it for long enough already. Never had anything to do with it? You forget that I was there, Mr. Graydon, on the very afternoon of the incident. Obviously, I'm not a complete stranger to the pawnbrokers. I'm currently on the lookout for an armchair to finish my study. No, you were there to redeem an article. I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. You literally tried to escape from him. Do you have something to add, Inspector? Inspector, just say it. Eh. Come again, Sunshine. You were there too, in fact, weren't you, Inspector? That afternoon? Well, yes, I do remember meeting yourself in the pawnbroker this that afternoon. You, your young Japanese assistant the accused were all present, as I recall. And at that time, this witness, Mr. Graydon, was trying to acquire a particular article. Um, well, now. I'm afraid I don't remember too clearly. What? But but you must! I'm not going to lie and pretend I remember something I don't. What's going on here? Gonna see Soda's picture before, didn't he? You know, from the same cameras that Hurley installed in Windabanks? Yes, of course. Indeed, the gentleman pictured bearing a striking resemblance to the witness, I must say. Exactly, which proves that Mr. Green was in the shop in question, after in question. At no point have I denied that fact. I merely entered the shop to pursue an articles on sale of war with the broker, nothing more. This makes no sense. I see why Mr. Green might be trying to cover his tracks. But why would Gregson be trying to avoid giving testimony of what happened? Oh no, that's all he's going to say on the matter, is it? What do you think, Miss Uno? I think he has no intention of telling us anything. He's well aware that he less says the less chance he has himself giving himself away. Hmm, the complete opposite of Hurley, then. Seems to think that the more he says, the better. He's a man to put prize a little more info from his witness's lips. All thanks to the Skulkin brothers. Yes, they were the key to it after all. So as he says, they had nothing to do with Windebanks. Well, we know that's not true. Perhaps we will be a good time to have a proper look at the court record. Good idea. You never know what tiny scrap of info might be a valuable weapon. Okay. 
Okay. Let me see here. I need something that relates to him. I'm trying to think what Evan should I do. It's hard to figure out what Evan should I implicate him. I feel like I should bring out the disc. I don't know if it's the right answer, though. I think it has to do with the music box disc. Because you- I know you came for this disc, of course. Yeah. What, do I have to present it, I guess? Yeah, Gregson was like, questioning about that statement. Maybe I should just present this. Have you ever seen this disc before, Mr. Graydon? Why, is it supposed to mean something? This disc was until the day of his murder and pawned in the, in the bank's shop. It was deemed by the defendant, Miss Gina Lestrade, that afternoon. However, somebody mysteriously tried to take it from her. That somebody was you, of course. Wasn't it, Mr. Graydon? As I have reiterated numerous times now, you are mistaken. That was not me. I had never seen that disc before in my life. It may have escaped your notice, but there is a small smear of blood on the disc. Ah, oh, yes, resulting from a subversion of the thumb, perhaps. That is right. The surface of the disc is covered in hundreds of tiny metal bumps. The skirmish acquired the disc, the thumb of the person who tried to take it suffered minor lacerations. Oh, you're your hand! So, while the disc bears remnants of the skirmish of the form of the smear, Thumb the person in question must bear the remnants also in the form of a scratch. Good gracious, indeed it must! Sir Graydon, you refuse to allow a court officer to examine your arm before. Are you gonna now refuse to examine your thumb? Because I have no doubt that it bears a small scratch consistent with the smear of blood on this disc. Gah. Well, well. It would seem that I underestimated you. What, what is the meaning of this? So you admit it now. That you admit you have a scratch on your thumb from when you attempted to take the disc from the defendant. Ora, ora. Well, Mr. Graydon. It would appear there has been something of a misunderstanding here. I did not attempt to take the disc as you put it. No, quite the reverse. What are you trying to say? It's really quite simple, you see. The disc was mine from the outset. Is there some crime in taking an item that you uh, own out of pawn? What? It would seem, Mr. Graydon, that in this piece of evidence, my learned friend has established a link between yourself and the incident. Mm. Accordingly, you will tell the court everything you know about this disc now. As you wish. Though I'm quite sure it has nothing whatsoever to do with the pawnbroker's murder. Okay. Another witness testimony, the disc. There's not a note on this saying for there's a note saying for McGilded, but the item belongs to me. The redemption ticket was stolen from me and by the accused that filthy guttering on the day in question. I proceeded at once to the shop in order to explain my situation to redeem my article. In the end, of course, the disc was taken by the police, 
In other words, I had absolutely no reason to break into the shop later that same night. Did I hear you correctly, sir? McGilded, you say? The famous London philanthropist. That was burned. Who perished in this very courtroom two months ago after being acquitted of a distinctly messy murder? Yes, my lord. The one and the same. Good lord, Mr. Graydon. Are you saying that Mr. McGilded and yourself were... were acquainted? Yes, that's correct. Ora! Well, I certainly didn't expect to hear that name other than here in my courtroom again. According to what Gina told us, this disc was placed into the pond on that fateful night two months ago. McGilda himself gave instructions to the deposit at Windabanks. It's funny that Mr. Graydon here is claiming the disc belongs to him then, isn't it? In all likelihood, he's lying. So he appeared that afternoon at Windabanks in order to get his hands on McGilda's disc for some reason. Counsel, you will commence your cross-examination, please. Okay. The disc. I gotta press a lot of info. Would you care to explain how this belongs to you? As you will observe, a communications opera such as myself commands a fine salary. You are certainly Exquisitely dressed, sir. So you see, I have little need to make use of the services provided by the pawnbrokery trade. However, I did once find myself in difficulties having misplaced my purse whilst on an errand, which is why I pawned my fine black overcoat to the broker in question. You claimed that was your overcoat. Maka, hmm. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Obviously. In my haste, I clean forgot that the music box this was in its pocket. And yet, there is a note in the reds for McGilded. I am a collector of rare and unusual music box music. I first met Mr. McGilded at a gentleman's club in the city, and it was interesting to discover that he shared my pension in that area. So, the dissing question is a pre production sample. I promised to let Mr. McGilded hear it. But then you forgot it was in the pocket of the overcoat you were forced upon. Yes, exactly. Jeannie didn't mention any of that in her testimony two months ago, did she? No, because Mr. McGilded had threatened her to keep her mouth shut, which means that if we dig too deeply here, it's going to expose Gina's perjury. Fuck. Dang it! I wanted to bring it up, but I, I guess we can't. Oh dear, this is complicated, isn't it? Let's leave it alone for the time being. So you're saying that Mr. Stray lifted the ticket from your pocket or bag? That's right, despite being mindful of danger when walking the salubrious areas of her kind yeah. frequent. Mr. Stray did no such thing. Well, of course you would take that stance, but the girl's a regular offender. You came to the pawnbroker that day to prayer with all the info you needed to identify the defendant. You were looking for her and that's what brought you to Windabanks. To get your hands on Mr. McGilded's disc. My learned friend is a veritable font of nonsense. Nonsense? I concur with the prosecution. Counsel, you will refrain from conjecturing in this way, is that clear? Yes, my lord. Then I will continue my testimony for what possible use it can be. Press. Everything is press only. Have you ever been to Windebanks before? Only once, for the purposes of pawning something. But like many, I enjoy browsing in such establishments. So when you notice that the pickpocket had taken your ticket, you chased after her, is that correct? Yes, that's right. I didn't notice at first, of course. Such is the art of the pick purse. But when I did, I headed to the pawn brokery at once in order to reclaim my coat before the thief could. I was merely trying to recover what was rightfully mine in the first place. Ugh. 
can say what he likes because he knows we have no evidence to contradict him on this. In the end, of course, the disc was taken by the police. <laughs> Gregson! Yes, it was taken by Inspector Gregson here, wasn't it? That's right, this was the very man. Apparently, the police are collecting anything that has a connection to Mr. McGilded as evidence. Is there something wrong, Inspector? Um, well, um, what do you mean? The last remark Mr. Grady made in his seemed to trouble you some way. Um, no. No, it didn't. It's nothing. Leave it alone. Let me ask you this, Inspector. Why is Scotland Yard gathering Mr. McGilded's possessions? I can't you sell something like that, Sunshine. What is in it, Inspector? Investigative secrets. Uh, yes, exactly. You should know all about that. Magnus McGilded, who died so unexpectedly after his trial two months ago. A man renowned for throughout the capital for his great contributions to public life. Yet, he had a dark side too. Where are you going with this, Von Zix? I suppose the police are dealing with the aftermath of his nefarious activities, are they? Th that's enough. Coppers like me have duties to carry out that we're not at liberty to talk about. Th th that's all you need to know. Duties conferred by Lord Strongheart, I presume? The Lord Chief Justice appears to have great faith in you, Inspector. The bottom line is, if you want to get more out of me, you're going to need Lord Strong's paw print first. What's all this about? It's like there's something going on between Gregson and Lord Von Zeke's here. Well, it would appear that the inspector has revealed all he has liberty to reveal. Mr. Gray, let's return to your testimony. Gladly, my lord. Alright, I want to press more of his info before... Before Gregson interrupted. That's what the inspector said, at least, as he sees my disc. And thanks to that skirmish w that wastrel, I snagged the end of my thumb at the same time. And the disc in question is this... Disc here. Yes, it is. Scotland Yard have indeed been gathering items believing the property of Mr. McGilded. Presumably to aid their investigations in some way. Not something I would be aware of. I really didn't know the man well anyway. After all... I'm merely a communications officer with a penchant for music boxes and flamboyant poises. Poses. In other words, okay, he, he had nothing to do with him. Are you sure about that? Perhaps you have seen something of value among the forfeited items? No, not at all. Oh? A value war was brought in by the police to assert everything in the shop. Without exception, every article on the shelves was common or garden bric-a-brac. In that case, it's clear that you broke into the shop later that day in order to recover Mr. McGilded's disc. Have you not been listening, man? Uh, even if I wanted to recover the disc, he may recall I'd been seized by the police that afternoon. It was no more than in the shop that night, I kept saying I had simply no reason to break in. So there was nothing in Mr. Gilded left in that shop that night? Nothing this man might have been after? I wonder if that's really true. Runo, if you have some evidence, then let him have it. I'm dying to see what that irritating ish heard expression of his crumbles. Gilded slipped the disc in his coat pocket and had it deposited at window banks. Then, when he realized he was going to be arrested on suspicion of the omnibus murder, he threatened Gina and forced her to take the redemption ticket. There is no doubt about it, that Windus is lying through his pearly white teeth. Police were obviously after anything left behind was Mick Gilda as well. That's why Inspector Gregson ended up taking the disc into custody that day. But Greg seems very strange about all this. There must be a reason for that, I'm sure. I just don't know what it is. 
But now I need to focus on exposing the fact that Mr. Graydon's lying in his testimony. What reason would he have to break into the shop other than the disc? Hmm... It is hard right now. To know what am I gonna present? Is it the redemption ticket? Ten thirty. I want to. I'm going to present this if it gets anything. It reveals a damn inconsistency in that last statement. Pretty sure it's wrong. Damn, you say. As I look at you, Council, I see your trembling hand, your pallid expression, your perspiring brow. Huh? It seems to me that is the damning inconsistent in here with the mystical place compared to your assertion. God dang it. Ugh, he has a damning tongue. You invite it, sir. Hmm. I'm very certain it has. It's the redemption ticket, isn't it? Am I wrong? Yeah, the coat. The pawnbroker's ticket coat. Yeah, it has to be that. Is it this? So, but what? This was taken by the police. Other words, had no reason to break into the shop. Stone from me by the accused. Oh, okay. Okay. So you think this is yours, right? But the blood is actually Mr. Mason's, right? It's presented. You think this is yours, right? There's a clearly something odd about that last thing we made on the witness. Oh, I didn't hear indeed. Your behavior counts. Oh my god. Wait a second, is it really? Wait. It's, it's, I know it's the redemption ticket, but like. So it's not the coat. Dang it, I can't you I don't know if it's not this. Maybe this? I don't know if it has anything. We only got this because it had the cat photo. Maybe this? I don't know. I'm trying to th I'm trying I'm thinking so much, but I'm keep getting it wrong. I am have three lives left, and I don't want a game over, so. Fuck it, pawnbroker sickers box? Okay, was I right before? Okay, was I right before? Okay, I'm doubting. I'm st I'm doubting statement number five. Okay, this one. Okay, this one. I ha this one has to be the statement. I thought it was three for a second or two, but now I'm very certain it has to be one of these two. Okay, I'm. I'm. Okay, I presented this one before, obviously. 
So, maybe this one? If this doesn't work, then I am gonna- Then I- I'm lost right now. I have two lives left, so... Oh, really? The box? The Dissuels deposit in Wonder Banks on Magnus Peculiar Instructions. You knew that, that you went in there with an intention of obtaining it for yourself. Conjecture again in any case. The disc was taken into custody by the police that afternoon. The witness had no reason to visit the pawnbroker again that night. Sorry, my learned friend. But that's not true. Oh, you countered that against him? What? Mr. McGill had another article in Pawn at Windebank. As this second pawnbroker's ticket proves. Ugh. There are two articles belonging to Mr. McGill in the one bank pawnbroker. The reason you broke into the shop that night was to recover the second one. Together with your two accomplices, the Skulkin Brothers. Ugh. Hmm. This is the second ticket, is it? What is th what had the man deposited? Article description reads, it's one small box. A rather vague description, it seems to me. Are you suggesting that I broke into the pondering with these clowns in order to steal some trinket box? I believe there are adequate grounds to suspect that you did. This is absurd. Why on earth would I do such a thing? Once the article had been forfeited, I could simply walk into the shop and purchase it. There will be absolutely no need for me to resort to theft. That's a good point. Hmm, indeed. The witness makes a solid argument. So that means that, for some reason, this Gladen fellow needed the small box that very night, does it? It's time to put an end to this nonsense, my lord. Could you be a little less cryptic, Lord Von Zeeks? I do hate to ruin my learned friend's argument, but the truth is quite incontrovertible. On the night in question, no small box was taken from Windebank's pawnbrokery. And West assured my prosecution can prove it. What? Good gracious! Inspector, show the photographic prints to the court if you please. Uh, yes, sir! What prints? These prints were taken from one of the detective security cameras. Ah, uh, Hurley's red heading recorders, recorders again. As briefly explained using this plan of the shop layout. The victim's establishment was firing his automatically automatic cameras in two locations. One set to capture the counter where Mr. Rindebank received his customers. And the other was set to capture the shelves on which articles were placed for sale once forfeited. According to the information on this ticket, Mr. McGilded's small box had been forfeited already. Two days before the incident, at 9 p.m. at 13 of April, to be precise, which means they have been on the shelves of the forfeited items in the shop front. And now, what I have here is a print taken by one of the cameras about two hours before the incident. That's 11 p.m. on 15 of April. Hmm, the victim certainly had a very full shop, it would appear. And then here we have another print. This one was taken about two hours after the incident. Can we put this in the court record? I actually want to compare this. I see, we have two pictures to compare. Though I must say, placing them side by side leads me. Stereoscope? Fuck, my eyes can't do cross eyed. It's very hard. Dear me, that's starting to make my headache. Obviously, the Scotland Yard we consider theft as one of possible motive in this case. We explore the possibility have been something in this ticket in addition to the victim's life. So your men have already compared these two prints thoroughly, Inspector. Uh, y yes sir. We counted every single item in the, each of these two photograph prints. And the Yard's conclusion is that exactly the same number of present in both. Hmm. In other words, nothing was taken from the pawnbroker in the night in question. My learned friend's assertion is nothing more than hopeful fantasy. Gah! I don't believe it. Stereoscope? If I could have just shown the Smith Gilded's pawn box. 
I might have been able to break him down at last. You know what, Uno? I've been thinking. About these two photographs are really exactly the same. What? So, Counsel, in the light of the evidence put forward by the prosecution, what is your position? It seems, in fact, that the night in question nothing was stolen from the victim's establishment. Do you ever accept the prosecution assertion? I don't know. Could it be there's something hidden description in these two photographs have been somewhere? Use a piece of evidence. Before I give my answer, my lord, I'd like to try something if I may. Try something? What do you mean, counsel? I'll need to use a certain piece of evidence from the court record to identify the discrepancy. I'm not entirely sure I thought you should know, Judge. What piece of evidence do you attempt to use to help you identify the description between the two prints? Obviously the stereoscope. I like to use this device, my lord, to view the two prints stereoscopically. Oh, yes, you caught the bug at last. You can't resist it, can you? You got the class side compulsion. Gajura number three, what a surprise. Come on, Uno. Let's put the pictures in place and see what this com wonderful contraption shows us. There we go. Now look through the eyepiece. What? What is that? I wasn't sure at first, but there's a clear description between these two prints. Wh what? You must identify the location in question for the court counsel. Indicate the precise location or description in which you speak. Granted, these two prints are almost identical. However, there is one minor discrepancy between them. Wh what? Let me look at these two pictures stereoscopically. There's a box. A single area stands out being different, the location of this small box. Let me see, wait. Unbelievable! Through my eyes of deduction, I have never seen this before. But <laughs> by Jove, you're right. You know how extraordinary everyone has Pooger's face. What this tells us is very simple. Mr. McGill's small box was indeed not stolen from Windenbanks on the night in question. However, there can be no doubt that somebody picked it up this particular box and then returned it to its place on the shelves. Are you suggesting that the small box originally deposited by Mr. McGilded is in fact? Yes, the very same small box I just identified in those photographic prints. Mindless guesswork. What if it was? So a box is moved on that shelf, nothing was stolen. Which means, quite simply, that nothing has changed. But that may be true, but... Alright, McGilded's box wasn't stolen then. But doesn't the fact that it was movable like that change things? It changes everything. I believe this changes everything about the case. How can that possibly be? The crucial point is the fact that what was moved by was a small box. In other words, we have to consider what might have been inside that box. What are you suggesting? What's inside the box? I'm suggesting that we need to examine the box as soon as possible. A vital piece of evidence which sitting on the shelves at Windebanks as we speak. That won't be necessary. Some little box belonging to a man who died two months ago can't possibly be relevant to this trial. The court does not uphold your objection, Lord Von Seeks. Bailiff, arrange for an officer to go to Baker Street at once. Obtain the small box in question and bring it back here for further examination. This will change the case entirely, but I don't know how much. We should have a report within half an hour. 
I think perhaps we should recess for a short while while the evidence is brought forward. To be hoodwinked by such a farce. Hm. Disappointing. I beg your pardon, Lord Von Zeex. This is nothing but a smokescreen, a Nipponese specialty you would see. Yeah, you really, you really have to stop being racist. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm just a normal Japanese lawyer. What are you trying to say? My learned friend has persisted with the same line of reasoning from the very beginning. That this witness's intent was to steal an article belonging to Mr. McGilded from the pawn brokery. Yet common sense tells us that none of the articles have value enough to be worth stealing in the first place. Exactly. It would be beyond absurd to break into a place for stealing such commonplace property. Hmm. If your lordship recalls, Mr. McGilder perished two months ago, immediately after the conclusion of his trial. A trial which he was found not guilty, a trial which he was established he was the upstanding member of society and reputation implied in fact. So I propose a toast to my learned friend and his most insightful defense. The articles of this upstanding member of society pun were entirely ordinary. A black overcoat just happened to have a music box disc in one of the pockets and a small box. I assure you, I wouldn't accept even if the man tried to make such a gift to me. Now that does make a lot of rather sense. It's not as if the gold were jewels, is it? Though goodness most McGilda was richer now. But you can't put dollars in a check at Pawnbrook and I'm quite for certain at that prosecution's argument is undeniably compelling. It is incumbent on the defense now to bolster its argument. To explain what possible insignificance these commonplace articles pawned by this fine citizen could have. Well, counsel, your argument is in fact demonstrable. Are you able to show proof that the disc or the box is intangible one way related to this case? Well, um... What's the matter, Luna? We know that they're related, don't we? They're both vital pieces of evidence. Yes, of course. And I both know that. We know of McGilda's true character. We know that this is significant. Even though we don't know why. But if we explain all that to the court at this point, we'll have to acknowledge that McGilda's acquittal two months ago was a mistake. But the defense's argument was flawed based on false information. Oh no. And that would mean admitting that Gina committed perjury. But Genie, could it be that Von Zeke snows? Is that why he's doing this now? Because he's anticipated everything? But maybe. This could be a great opportunity for us. Sorry, what do you mean, Iris? Well, what is it that you always say, Luna? Sooner or later, the truth comes out every time. Yes, that's true, alright? The exact significance of things that the guilt of the positive with Mr. Woodenbeck is something that only Gina can explain to the court. But if I put her on the stand to testify about that, it could critically damage our chances of winning this case. What's the right thing to do here? I'm saving the game! But we're not gonna end this off the part now. I think we should do it. I know it's risky, but we need every single info that we can. And I'm certain that, that we can get her innocent. For the love of God. Had Gina testify. My lord, the defense would like to make a proposal. Oh, what proposal, counsel? Well, as the court awaits the arrival of Mr. McGilded's small box, I would like to call the defendant, Miss Gina Lestrade, to the witness stand. The defendant? To what end? It's too with the various articles deposited at window banks by Mr. McGilded, my lord. Mr. Strait has info relating to them. I believe it would be beneficial for the court to hear what she has to say. It will prove that the significance of the articles in question once and for all. Well, well, things are becoming interesting. 
I presume you consider the implications of the testimony you're proposing. In particular, the impact you'll have on the accused standing and indeed your own. I have. Go in or go home. Lord Von Seeks, can we care to explain our last remark? The prosecution accepts the defense's proposal. I move to interrupt the cross-examination of the current witness and hear from the accused herself. Very well, if you have no objection. So, if the court will now hear the testimony of the defendant, Miss Gina Lestrade, you witnesses currently in the set may step down until further notice. Then I shall bid you a good day. Wait. You, sir, shall remain in the stand while Mr. Stray testifies. As you wish. Alright then, Gina. It's time. I know this will be hard, but please, put your faith in me here. We're gonna get you innocent, no matter what. Good luck, Gununo. Are the Skokin brothers finally gone? Yes, they're gone. The articles in that Mr. McGill had deposited in Windebank's pawnbrokery are an intimately related with the Omnibus case, the trial which was heard in the courtroom two months ago. Oh, yes, I remember this young lady being brought before me in that trial as well. That's right, my lord. Her testimony helped us establish the innocence of the defendant, Mr. McGill did. The Omnibus case was intriguing to say the least. And now here we are all again, the same players in that trial facing each other once more. A twist of fate perhaps, my Nipponi's friend. Allow me to recap the events of two months ago. An old brickmaker was stabbed to death by in an omnibus running along London's winter streets. Apart from the victim, there was only one other person in the carriage, Mr. McGilded. Naturally, he was the prime suspect for the murder, but as the trial progressed, another possibility emerged that the murder in fact took place above the defendant's head above the roof deck, with the body then being dropped through the skylight into the carriage below. It was Mrs. Strade whose testimony brought that possibility to light. At that time, the instant Mrs. Strade was concealed under the carriage in the under a seat in the carriage, hoping to pick the pockets of unsuspecting passengers. Then, immediately after the trial, having been acquitted of the murder, Mr. McGilded died in his very courtroom in the most unextraordinary and extraordinary of circumstances. A mystery that remains unsolved even now, two months on, as indeed the, uh, the omnibus murder itself. Be it as in May. I recall neither the this or the small box being mentioned in the course of these proceedings. Mr. Strayed. Believe in me, Gina, come on. You, would you tell the court now, please? What really happened in the omnibus two months ago, I mean? Come on, Gina. I don't know what you mean. I said what I know. And what about everything you told us yesterday from the inside your prison cell? Believe in us, Gina. Please, Mr. Strayed. This is extremely important. But, but... Remember, little girl. If it transpires that you willfully held information at trial two months ago, the Home Office will seek to per prosecute you for perjury. And naturally, you will lose all credibility as a witness. Although, let's face facts, you have little credibility to lose. Jenny, don't listen to him. Please, you have to trust Duno now. Iris, we're on your side. Alright then, I'll talk. It's the right choice, Gina. But what cost? Well, it would seem that my learned Nipponi's friend is hellbent on bringing the entire courtroom down about its ears. So be it. I must confess I'm struggling to understand what's going on. Earth is happening here. 
However, it appeared that Mr. McGill had pawned articles in an extraordinary case of the Omnibus. Harbor secrets of which we have been heard to unaware. So, Mr. Strait, you will now give your testimony before the court about the events of two months ago. You will reveal the truth of commodity is sorely lacking your original statements. This is it then. Everything's going to come out. Like Von Zeke said. This could bring the whole courtroom down about my ears as a lawyer I'm prepared to take that risk. Let's do this. Tooth is that Blickmaker Cobas in the cabin the omnibus the whole time? When the Irishman dragged me out from under the seat, I saw that disc on the floor. All of a sudden I heard a scream from over me head and that pair on the roof went off to call the slops. That's when Mr. McGill is the driver's intent to to do a run at the pawn shop roundabout. He threatened me about not to snitch and say nothing to no one about what I've seen or heard. Good grief, this is outrageous! What you just told the court bears no resemblance to your testimony two months ago. As you say, my lord. Then there's a every chance I may have educated an error in Mr. McGilded's trial. Sounds very much as should the man deliberately deceive this court in an effort to cover up the most wicked of schemes. Without doubt, your lordship is correct, and great injustice was done in this courtroom two months ago. The actions, actions of the accused in that trial of this witness and my learned friend are entirely inexcusable. I don't believe it! The whole trial was a farce, it was all lies! The McGillard fellow was rotten to the court, that was that pickpocket. Oh, forget the lawyer from the east, they were all in on it together! You're wrong, you lot of you, the Miss Anahodo, the lawyer there didn't know nothing about it. Humbug! I don't think so, are we really expected to believe that? He really stitched everyone up, didn't he? What a operation to get the man off scot free. Unforgivable! Stop! The lies have to stop! Stop! Yes, the defense made a terrible error of judgment. I take the ten full respondents, except for whatever consequences are deemed appropriate. However, it's imperative that the court allows the witness to elaborate on her testimony, because the true significance of McGilda's pawn articles are being brought to light. Very well, my learned student friend. Given the depths of calamity you just plunged yourself into, this may well worth be worth hearing. Words fail me, this situation is utterly deplorable. Mr. Naruhodo. Yes, my lord. I will decide upon your fate following the conclusion of this trial. Yes, of course, my lord. Lie me, Mr. Naruhodo. Now, counsel, pursue with the cross examination. Like, what was I supposed to do? All the evidence was given in front of me. And like, I wanted to continue with this trial to pursue the truth, but you got- but the game wouldn't let me. <laughs> and you were hiding in the cabin at the time as well, weren't you, Miss Lestrade? If I remember rightly, in the storage compartment underneath one of the seats, yeah, that's right. It's pitch black under there, so you can't see nothing at all. No, in your testimony two months ago, I feel certain that you claim Mr. McGillard was the sole passenger, did you not? False testimony, my lord. That's that's what I you told me this, I had to say. But it's important that you tell us the truth now. Where are Mr. McGillard and the va victim acquaintance? I don't know. I did hear him talking a lot. What were they talking about? Well, I couldn't hear too well, if I had to say. But I think it was about money or something. I kept... What are they doing? Not buying or not... Buying or not... Or not buying. What are these guys doing? Is there something you'd like to share with us with the court inspector Gregson and Mr. Graydon? Inspector, Mr. Graydon! Wah! But blimey, you're trying to give me a heart attack! You have been whispering to each other for quite some time now. Tell us what is this discussion about? The discussion with this fella? Pull the other one, Sunshine. You think I got anything to do with this shady jet like this? 
I have nothing to say to this uncouth detective after you deprived me of that disc that was rightfully mine. But they clearly been talking the entire time I've been cross-examining Gina. It's as if they've been negotiating. You will kindly refrain from talking amongst yourself while the witness is giving testimony. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, my lord. What were those two talking about? Mr. Stray, continue with your testimony, please. Yeah. I was like wondering, what the fuck? Why is their backs turned? Okay, okay. Something about money. Kept talking about buying and not buying? Hmm, perhaps business dealings of some kind. Well, anyway, they got louder and louder and started to sound like a proper fight. I was pretty scared by then. I hardly dared to believe, and then all of a sudden, I heard a noise like someone keeling over on the floor. It was booming loud and all. I believe you let on an involuntary scream. Yeah, that's what gave me away. When the Irishman dragged me out, when I say saw the disc on the floor. The was the disc you saw this disc? Yeah, I reckon it probably was. It was right next to the cub lying on the floor. Could this disc have belonged to the victim, perhaps? I don't know, but Mr. McGilder picked it up pretty smartish. And then he sat on the cove with the knife in his belly up on the seat. What did he say to you at that time? He told me not to say a word about the, what I seen or what I heard to no one. About the disc and all. I was dead scared. The way he was looking at me, I thought... If I didn't go along with it, I'd like get stuck with that knife too. Hmm. Then he started asking me a load of questions. Like what me name was and where I lived and that. And what he asked me about being a diver too. And after a while, what had happened in the carriage was, was noticed. Yeah, that's right. First there was some kind of rapping noise. All of a sudden I heard a scream from the... Okay. There was two gentlemen occupied his seats on the roof deck, I believe. That's right. They must have looked down the skyline and noticed the cove with the knife in his guts. When they screamed, the driver put up the horses and McGillard got me out, me out of sight. Out of sight? Where? Back under the seat where I started off. Once the carriage came to an halt, the crew cubs from the roof ran off the butt stop at the slops. If they immediately left to fetch the police, it would appear that they were unre entirely unrelated to the incident. Hmm. So that left Mr. McGillard, the driver, and you had still at the scene. Yeah, only the driver didn't know I was there because I was under the seat. Heard the cabin door opening from the voice from outside. A driver, yes. He was also testified in the trial, I believe. He was an accomplice. A fellow who went by the name of Beppo, if memory serves me, cold. I'm so cold. <laughs> okay. What did McGill and the driver say to each other? I don't know what happened. Stuff like that, and mainly. That's when McGilder slipped the driver into some, some tin and run up to the poncho while I was about. That poncho obviously seemed to be in Windebanks and Baker Street. Just a moment, counsel. Do you mean to tell me? The driver gave false testimony in that trial as well. Perhaps the uh, excursion to the pawn rookie slipped his mind when he was on the stand. Indeed, Lord Von Seeks. McGilder took off his coat and gave it to the driver. Folded up and careful like and like before landing it over. When I saw him do that, I remember thinking that coat was w and what's in it's gotta be worth a few bob. Yes, Gene was sure that the disc must be worth more than that. Mr. Mr. Ank was suggesting, wasn't she? I remember her quibbling with him over the press of that afternoon at the pawn brokery. The diver looked pretty happy when McGilly flashed him his brass in his face and like, he went up running off to the click. He's like, oh, I have some money, I'm cold. When I get some money to pawn off, ooh, money, <laughs> free money. That's what anyone would do in the face of money. And then the blog tried to call me and told me to come out from the dog's cabin. He threatened me not to snitch and say nothing to no one or what I've seen or what I have heard. 
threaten you how exactly? He told me if I only been a scopper if I did exactly what he said. Which included giving false testimony in court two months ago. Yeah, that's it. And there was one other thing he said. Which was... He told me if I have to hang on to the ticket from the pawn shop and make sure not to lose it. The ticket? Well, I never. He said that if he didn't show up to get the ticket off of me from two months past, I had to go to the pawn shop and pay the money to keep it in lug to stop it from being forfeited. He let me some wisp brass to pay for it. But really? Why on earth would Mr. McGill have done such a thing? Pausing his overcoat with a pawnbroker before his arrival at the police? It makes no sense at all. There would be, seem to be only one logical explanation, my lord. What Mr. McGill had the driver deposit wouldn't bank was something he didn't want the police to see. Something very important that he needed to hide at all costs. Anyway, after that, he let me go, so I legged it before the copper showed up. That's it, huh? Thank you, Mr. Strade. Thank you, Counselor. I heard enough. I believe you have a reason to understand what transpired on the omnibus. It would appear that on that night two months ago. A negotiation was taking place on the omnibus. However, matters did not run smoothly when the parties involved began to quarrel over price. Mick Gilded took what he wanted by force. At the expense of the other man's life. Which proves my point that this is clearly extremely valuable in some way. I don't understand why as yet. And two days ago, precisely two months after the omnibus incident, Mick Gilded's coats and its contents were due to being forfeited. I didn't know what I should do with the ticket. I mean, the cove died in right after his try, I knew that. So you decide you would claim the articles as your own. Well, why not, eh? They were only gonna be forfeited, why should I- Why shouldn't I have got them? Anyway, you can't blame me for thinking about it. Think about it ain't no crime. Mr. Strait, it would appear that Mr. McGillard was prepared to kill in order to possession of this disc. Do you know why that would be? Eh? I ain't got a clue. But I reckon it must be worth a fair bit of blast. Evil's probably gonna sell it. Sell it. And you can't blame me for thinking that. Thinking ain't no crime. Hmm. My lord. The evidence your lordship request has been located and is ready for court inspection, sir. I've got the music box. What is this box? The mysterious little box deposited by McGilded two months ago. There's no doubt in my mind that it's a key piece in this far-reaching puzzle. Alright, we're almost at the conclusion of this case. Holy shoot. Collude collusion. Perjury. Everything that can go wrong in this trial. Evidence that I'm seeing right in front of my very eyes. We're almost there. And I guess I'll see you guys all next time.